Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Life Church. Those of you who are joining us online, welcome to you here in the room today. Wonderful to see you today. So glad to have you with us. While uh, our in house folks are making their way back to their seats, let me talk to you watching online. If you will uh, do us a favor this morning, like, comment, and share this video so that uh, one, we know where you're coming from, where you're joining us from. And then also so that others can hear the good news of Jesus, we would appreciate that. And uh, so thank you so much for joining us in our live stream this morning. We're glad that you are with us. Now, for the rest of you here in the house, if we can uh, gather in, we'll get started with the remainder of our service today. What a great week it's been. Uh, I don't know about you, but I love serving the Lord. I love being his messenger. I love being under his blessing and under his anointing and under his favor. Amen. And uh, so uh, Margo and I spent the day together yesterday. We, we like to flea market, and that's kind of our, our hang up. And so uh, sharing with Barb and, and uh, Cindy and Teresa, they were kind of together there about the treasure that I found yesterday and uh, just felt like it was, you know, God's favor for the day, you know. And uh, so uh, I was, we were in this primitive uh, furniture store, that means antique, that's been uh, made ready to use today. And so we were, Margo was paying for the few little knick-knack things we had bought and I was just kind of waiting around and I saw some books, and they caught my eye, and I walked over and looked, and long story short, it was called The Treasures of David, and it was a commentary by Spurgeon on the, on the Psalms, three volumes, and I just couldn't help myself, and so brought it home. Friday night, Margo and I went to Clinton to watch the final episode of season three of The Chosen, and uh, my, 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 my. It was good. I guess they did a version, uh, one of the uh, episodes last night, and then is, is it another one tonight? Is that right? Tuesday. Okay. So let me give my shameless plug for the chosen. Uh, if you haven't watched these final episodes yet, you need to. They will bless you. We were at the theater. We laughed and we cried and we laughed and we cried some more. I walked in after the men's uh, gathering last night. Margo was watching uh, the end of it again. And I already knew what was happening. I knew already knew what was coming, and I still cried. <laughs> Something about Jesus working miracles that just gets you. And so uh, if you don't have that, you need to get that. Before we went to watch the show at the theater, we uh, went over to Applebee's and had dinner. And uh, we're getting ready to leave. Got an opportunity to talk to the waitress about the chosen. Somebody who was not a Christian, not a believer, based on what we could tell from our conversations. And, and uh, so we're sharing with her about it. But more importantly than sharing with her about the chosen, we were sharing with her about a place where she could hear about Jesus. And so, man, this is an awesome tool that we can use to introduce people to Christ. And so uh, if you've not seen it yet, you're behind. You need to get caught up. You need to, you need to lock yourself away for a couple of days and binge season one and season two and season three and get caught up and and one it's going to bless you but two it's going to give you a tool to uh, help lead people to jesus let me share quickly with you some announcements and normally i would do this during the offering but i'm going to do things a little different today and uh so i'm different and i gave you an opportunity to shout amen but a couple of you were kind of on the verge of it but Anyway, you'll understand that more here in just a moment. So Tuesday, ladies, you're meeting at 3, 3.30, 5.30 for Jim, and then Feast and Festivals class will be here uh, Tuesday night at 7. We have a regular Wednesday night worship service this week. And then next Sunday is Super Bowl. I've challenged you to uh, wear your jerseys. Those of you that were talking smack last week that uh, the Chiefs weren't going to make it, well, shame on you. Uh, shows what you know and uh, anyway so wear your favorite jersey next week and uh, let's just have a little bit of fun uh, I, again I'm, I'm now this part I'm being serious about 
if you show up in a Broncos jersey, I, ex I expect to see you at the altar at the end of the service, <laughs> repenting, because the kingdom is here. Yeah. Chief's kingdom, we're teaching the Okay. Next, uh, next Sunday at the end of the service, uh, we have that Gatorade challenge out there for you. If we can raise $500 in that special offering, uh, then somebody will get to dump a Gatorade bucket full of ice water on moi. And uh, so if you've wanted to uh, take your vengeance out on me, here's your chance. And, uh, huh? No, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, I think what we're going to do, I think we're going to, uh, we'll have two separate drawings. We'll do it twice. If you, beat the, if you hit the 500 or more, we'll do it. We'll have two buckets. And then we'll do, uh, we'll have some uh, raffle ticket little things, you know, they have the number on it, and everybody will get one of those, we'll draw a number, and an adult will get to do it, and either a child or a youth will get to do it, all right, so double, double whammy, so that's next Sunday, youth Super Bowl party is at our house next Sunday night at five, we've been doing this since we got here, and it's just a great time to connect with our students, and uh, I'm going to watch the game one way or the other, so uh, they might as well come over and watch their pastor get crazy, and uh, some of you have been there, uh, especially when the Chiefs are in it, and uh, you know that I can get a little wound up, and so uh, I don't know if they come for the food, if they come for the football, or if they come just to watch the pastor get crazy, but yeah, the entertainment, <laughs> but anyway, so <clears throat> speaking of youth, uh, I want to announce to you this morning that uh, Brian and Wendy Collins are going to be taking over the youth ministry. And uh, we're super excited about that. They, uh, they've been filling in for us here and there over the last couple years. And uh, students love them. They're enjoying that ministry. We've been praying for somebody to do that for six years. God did not call me to youth ministry. There are some times when I'm having to pray through. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sub... I substitute taught when we were out in Everton for one year at the school, and they always wanted to stick me with teenagers, specifically junior hires. And I finally told them, somebody's going to die. <laughs> Either I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to kill one of them, but somebody's about to die. And uh, so they started putting me with kindergartners, and that was much better. And uh, we got along just fine. <laughs> So anyway, Brian and Wendy, thank you so much for doing that and helping us with that and uh, encourage them uh, in the process. We'll still be part of that in and out. Uh, here's, here's one thing. As the pastor, when, when I give somebody uh, a new ministry or a ministry opportunity, um, I, I like to step back because, one, I don't need to be doing everything, but two... When you're, when you're first starting out, the last thing you want is the boss looking over your shoulder at everything you're doing and wondering if you're doing it right. Hello? And so I, I may be here for a little while. I may not. Margo's still going to be involved. She, she's, she was a youth sponsor back when we were out in Ash Grove and Everton, and she, yeah, she connects with kids, and, and uh, you know, she said, the, the, the students love you. And I'm like, and I'm like wow, really? They... You know, sometimes I just don't know, I, you know, and so uh, I know they love her and, and everybody. So uh, Valentine's Day is February 14th, and uh, that's also the day that we will have our calm food distribution here at 830 in the morning. And then don't forget Winter Revival coming up the last weekend of this month, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and uh, you want to be a part of that. I mentioned I wanted to do things a little different this morning. So what I want to do is I want to share with you two sermonettes. Instead of one sermon, you're going to get two sermonettes. Is that all right? <clears throat> and um, I'll do my best to, to uh, you know, stay in our uh, normal time period. I think we'll be just fine. But uh, I want to share with you a sermonette uh, before we give in our tithes and offerings this morning. And let me tell you, every preacher that I know hates talking about money and hates talking about tithing. Uh, because everybody knows the preacher is all about getting your money. Right? 
the preacher just wants your money. That's what the world thinks, and unfortunately, some people in the church think it. But here's the deal. It's important for us to understand why we give. And so over the past two weeks, I've had at least three people contact me and ask me questions about tithing. Why do we do it? Should we still do it? How much should we do? How, how little can I get by with doing? A variety of questions. And so I want to just take about 10 minutes or so this morning and uh, do some teaching, some instructing on this subject matter. And then I promise you I'll keep the second sermon short. <laughs> and uh, I told him in the prayer time we were going to be here till at least 2 o'clock. Uh, but I promise you we won't be unless the Holy Spirit just falls and moves in a special way. So... Let's talk about this for just a moment. In the Old Testament, tithing was required by the law. I'm going to give you some scriptures that show this, that, that confirm or support this idea. In Leviticus chapter 27, and I think most all of my uh, references are NASB. If it changes, I'll tell you, okay? Uh, Leviticus 27 and verse 30, it says, Thus all the Lord, or let me, let me try that again. All the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, and of the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. God was speaking to Moses about things that were consecrated, about offerings, about sacrifices. He talks about the firstborn uh, belonging to him and being the Lord's, and he talks about the tithe belonging to him and and in other places, we'll see he talks about what that tithe is. What does that mean? Uh, I shared this, uh, I don't remember if it was last Sunday or, or maybe it was while I was talking with one of these folks. I, I, it all runs together for me sometimes. But the word tithe means a tenth. And so there was a portion, a tithe, a tenth that was to be brought to the Lord. In Numbers chapter 18, and verses 25 and 26, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When, not if, when you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. And so in case you were wondering... Uh, the preacher tithes. We, we learned a long time ago, uh, as followers of Christ, even well before I became a pastor, that uh, we could do better with the 90% that was left over than we could with the 100% and not giving God a portion, not giving him the tithe. And so here we see that this is speaking about the priests concerning the offerings and the tithes, how the Lord had set it up for them to be cared for and for them to have their needs met the people were to bring the tithe and bring the offering and the priests were then to tithe off of what was brought to them <laughs> one of the things as a minister in the assemblies of god is i'm required uh, as part of the agreement to keep my credentials to tithe half of my tithe to the southern missouri district and to make an offering to uh headquarters the the national office for the Assemblies of God, part of my tithe goes to them. Uh, they credential me. They, they give me, um, I want to choose my words wisely and carefully here, but they give me uh, uh, the blessing to be a minister under the title and the fellowship of the Assemblies of God. And, and part of that uh, agreement is that I will give them a portion of my tithe. So the rest of my tithe comes here. And, and all of what Margot earns, all of her tithe comes here. We're following what was taught in the scripture. In Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 24, again, New American Standard. Verse 22 says, you shall, you shall surely tithe. He said, don't call me surely. You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you, what you have sown, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. The tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, the firstborn of your herd and your flock 
so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And then it goes on to say, if the distance is too great for you to, uh, to bring the tithe, uh, since the place where your God is chosen is set, it's too far away, then you shall exchange it for money, bind the money in your hand, and bring it to the place which, God, which the Lord your God chooses. Here's the deal. Early in this chapter, it's speaking about what was clean and unclean regarding foods and, and, and sacrifices, but then it speaks of the issue of tithing. The purpose is to learn, according to Deuteronomy 14, learn to fear the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of fear about the boogeyman under your bed. I'm not talking about fear of heights. I'm not talking about that kind of fear of being in the dark. But instead, I'm talking about a holy fear, a reverence, a, a respect, an honor for who God is and what his word teaches. The scripture says if it's too inconvenient for the people to bring the actual portion of their produce or their flock, then they could exchange it for money and bring that to the place where it was to be received. The fourth passage in the Old Testament, and we're going to jump to the new here in just a minute, is 2 Chronicles 31.5. And here's what God's word says. Also, he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion of do to the priest and the Levites. I have a, uh, used to work for a man that was Jewish, and uh, he would tell you, I'm Jewish when it benefits me. And he was secular Jew, and uh, uh, yeah, when it was to his benefit, boy, he, he was pr proud as could be to be Jewish. But anyway, um, he, he told me that he rarely uh, would visit the, the synagogue, but that every year he would get a bill from them declaring what he owed. And he was expected to make payment. Now, you can rest easy. We're not going to start sending out invoices at Life Church. But that's how serious this is. The scripture says, give the portion due. Verse 5, as soon as the order was given, as soon as the order spread, the sons of Israel provided in abundance the first fruits of grain, new wine, oil, honey, and all the produce of the field. They brought in abundantly the tithe of all. Clearly, the law of Moses was to bring the tithe and the offering to the Lord. We talked about what the tithe is, kind of just the idea, the concept of it. Offerings, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but offerings were, are, are in addition to the tithe. They're the things given beyond the tithe. One of my favorite passages of uh, uh, Scripture is found in Malachi. At the end of the book, it talks about there will be no cattle in the stall, no, no, no uh, grain in the field, and this and that. Yet I will praise the Lord. Well, there's a, there's a preface to that. And in Malachi chapter 3, verses 5 through 12, in the opening verses of the chapter, it's speaking about a coming day of judgment. But that leads to, uh, from talking about a coming day of judgment, it, it flows then into a call for repentance. And the question that we must ask ourselves is, what did they need to repent of? If there's a call for repentance, it's there because there's a need for repentance. And so, what was it? In Malachi chapter 3, 3 verse 5 this is what God's word said it says then I God God is speaking then I will draw near to you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the idolaters and against all those who swear falsely against those who oppress the wage earners in, in his wages the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me says the Lord of hosts for I the Lord do not change Therefore, O sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. Here's the deal. We like that part that he's not, uh, that, that he's calling the sorcerers and the idolaters and all those things to repentance because we're not those things, right? Hopefully. But he continues on in verse 7. He says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. So return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, let me just 
put a plug in here. Here's what I know for sure. If God was beside you and God was with you at some point in your life, and now he's not, God didn't move. You say, how will we return? God says, will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? God replies, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So here's the answer to the problem. Here's the answer uh, where judgment is pending. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, the Lord says. And I love this. This is the only time in the scriptures that we see this. He says, test me now in this. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessings until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor your vine uh, in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord. All the nations will call you blessed for you shall be delightful. Uh, you shall be a delightful land. Please hear me clearly. I'm not saying if you give, God's going to give you a million dollars. I'm not saying he's going to give you a Cadillac or a BMW or, you know, a thousand acres or you're not going to, I'm not telling you you're going to win the lottery, but there is a principle. We refer to it as sowing and reaping. We're going to talk about that here in a minute when we go to the New Testament. And, and if we will be faithful and genuine giving from our heart god will bless us so i'm going to say amen that's good preaching preacher but that's the old testament and this is what i heard this week <laughs> this is what i heard this week that's good preaching preacher but that's the old testament um, but jesus fulfilled the law so we no longer live under the law so we don't have to keep the law because now we don't live under the law, we live under grace. And so the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. And my response to that is, you are correct. Yes, Jesus did fulfill the law. And we do now live under grace. But that does not mean that we no longer keep the Ten Commandments or other biblical, holy, righteous instructions from the law. What you're saying is we, live on, we don't live under the law, we live under grace, so we don't have to pay attention to the Old Testament anymore. What you're saying is that we can, uh, that we can go out and, and murder, and it's not a sin. We can go out and commit adultery, and it's not a sin because we're not under the law. We can take the Lord's name in vain because it doesn't matter. We're not under the law now. We're under grace. The law was given so that we could know right from wrong, good from evil, so that we could know what kind of life God would have us to live. But for sake of discussion, let's say we can throw the Old Testament away. <laughs> yeah, some folks are having a heart attack. <laughs> for sake of discussion only. If that's the case, if we can throw the Old Testament away, we don't have to live by that anymore, what does the New Testament say about tithing? Well, the truth be told... The New Testament does not command us to continue tithing. Woohoo! I was right. I knew it. The preacher's just after our money. It's a scam. Well, before you get too excited, <laughs> you may want to hear what the New Testament does have to say about giving. Let me share with you a couple passages. 1 Corinthians 16. Ooh, I'm trying to hurry. 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 1. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of, of Galatia, so do you also. In other words, I told them to do it, I want you to do it. On the first day of each week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may appoint, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Paul was instructing the, the, the New Testament church in Corinth to take up a collection the first day of every week for the saints, and he instructed the church in Galatia to do it too. 
So it wasn't just one place, it was two. And this was to be used for <coughs> caring for those Christians who were suffering great poverty and famine. And the money was to be taken to Jerusalem, and there it would be dispersed as there was need. Uh, some of you know this, some of you don't, but w part of what we do as Life Church is we minister to the need of the needy. We reach out. Second, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so Paul taught, you know, take a collection, we'll send it all to Jerusalem, we'll let them divvy it up and put it where the need is, and and we'll bless people accordingly. <clears throat> In Second Corinthians nine, verses six through ten, it says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else I say today, listen to this. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You hear me say that, that God loves a cheerful giver. You hear me say that all the time. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. I, I, I am not a prosperity preacher. But I'll tell you what I am. I'm a preacher who believes that God is faithful to supply our every need. He is faithful to meet our every need. We have to learn to be faithful to him and trust him. Paul takes on the teaching style of Jesus here, uh, uh, the form of a parable, a word picture. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. If I put one tomato plant out in the spring, I'll get some tomatoes. But if I put 10 tomato plants out, uh, buckle up, buttercup. We'll have tomatoes for the whole town, right? Sow in abundance, reap an even greater harvest. God loves a cheerful giver, one that gives from the heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Let's talk about those two phrases. Grudgingly means reluctantly, resentfully, uh, in an unwilling or sparing manner. And under compulsion means that we give because someone made me feel bad for not giving. So hear this. That is not the purpose of this teaching today. <clears throat> to make you feel bad or to make you feel guilty or to somehow manipulate you and twist your arm into giving. God has been faithful to Life Church from day one to supply our every need. And, and when people have come and people have gone. People have come and they've been amazing givers, faithful, generous givers, and they've left. And, and before they left, God had replaced their giving. He's been faithful. So if you think that my sharing this is some way to manipulate, oh, we need to get our offerings up, well, it wouldn't hurt. You know, the more we have, the more we can do, right? The more that's provided. But listen, that's not the purpose. The purpose is so that we can know what the will of the Father is. <clears throat> so let me read my notes because I, as I was praying through this again this morning, I said, the purpose is not for, uh, that's not the purpose today to bring you to a place of compulsion. If you feel like I'm trying to force you or manip manip manipulate you, then don't give. Just don't do it. Here's the deal. If you don't want to give, you might as well just keep it anyway. But if you feel God directing or correcting your heart and your attitude concerning giving, then give. You say, yeah, but that was Paul who was teaching. He's just another preacher trying to get in their pockets. That wasn't Jesus. That wasn't the Father. So what do you got to say about that, preacher? Well, let's see what Jesus taught. In Luke chapter 6, y'all still with me? It seems like you are, but, you know, sometimes people just shut the door when you start talking about this stuff. So 
In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, the New Testament, Jesus speaking, says, Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. By the way you measure, by the measure you give, it will be given back to you. In the verse before that, and I love it. <laughs> My flesh is saying, okay, now you're going to get to rub some noses in it. <laughs> and, and I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm human, okay? I love those people that think they know God's word. You know, well, the Bible says you shouldn't do this. Well, the Bible also says this. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I don't believe that. Well, honey, it don't work that way. In the verses before this given, it will be given to you. Verse 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Oh, brother, does the world like that one? Oh, baby, do we like that one? You're not supposed to judge, right? Don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but if we're going to accept one, then we've got to accept the other. The principle of giving is far-reaching. It's not just about the giving of our money or our resources. It's about the giving of ourselves, <laughs> our time. Jesus far exceeds the teaching of the law concerning giving a tithe, giving a tenth. He teaches to give with an overflowing, exceeding abundance because it will be given back to you in the same manner. And isn't that what Jesus has done in giving us salvation? He gives so much, and now we give back accordingly. Not that we can buy our salvation. Don't go there. We can't, there's nothing we could do. You, you can win the $1.25 billion lottery, and it's not enough. Okay, so don't go there. But as he gave so much, now we give, we offer him all that we are. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. <laughs> this, <laughs> time out. This does not mean that you shouldn't have a savings account. This does not mean that you shouldn't invest wisely and try to grow your, your, your wealth. It means, what it means is that, that we need to realize that everything in this life is temporary the things that we have while we're here in this life are temporary, but heaven is eternal. And there is nothing here on this earth that we get to take with us. Hearses don't pull U-Hauls. So with that said, as we are faithful and generous to give, we're storing up treasure in heaven. Every time we give, listen, here, here's the best way I can explain this. Uh, every time we give, we're investing in the kingdom. That investment may produce new souls for the kingdom. That investment may bring deliverance from poverty and from pain to the life of someone uh, in our community. That investment may facilitate this place for us to gather and to worship. But the truth of all of it is, the, the, in a nutshell of all of it is, that every time you give, you are furthering the kingdom of God on this earth. And isn't that what we've been praying one more, Mark 12, verse 41 to 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury. I like this. Sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. Woo-hoo, glory! They were putting in large sums, but a poor woman, widow, came and put in two small copper coins that amounted to a cent. And calling his disciples, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put out of their surplus, but she put out of her poverty. 
Some translations say she put out of her need. She put in all she owned, all that she had to live on. Listen, it's not about how much you give. It's about the condition and the motivation of your heart. I love that Jesus tells this story. Uh, again, it's not about the amount of our gift. It's, uh, our, our giving is about the motivation of our heart. The motivation of your heart speaks volumes about how much you trust God and do you believe that he will supply your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus? Do you really believe that God can do all things? Even make your 90% go further than the 100%? I stopped trying to figure it out. I, I, just, I, I just quit. Because we have discovered, and this is not a pat on the back, this is just an encouragement to you. We've discovered that God's math is different than our math. When I keep the 100%, there's more month than there is money. But somehow, when I'm faithful to give, when I'm moved to give, when I'm generous and cheerful in my giving, I'm not lacking, folks. I mean, I'm not driving a BMW 750 LI, black, black. Baby, I know. I'm, you know. But, uh, but I am blessed, and he provides my every need. Let me share with you two passages from, from uh, Proverbs, and, uh, and then we're going to go to the next message. Are you ready? All right, two passages from Proverbs, and uh, after I do that, I'm going to let the ushers receive your offering. And while they're doing that, I'm going to go on into the next message. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth. From the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Listen, I don't have any kids at home anymore. And so if y'all start bringing me heads of lettuce and bags of potatoes, uh, we're Margo and I are going to be in trouble. Hello? Uh, we'll, we'll use that through the church and we'll minister and bless and we'll, be, we'll reach out to people. You know, there was a day when people brought a chicken because that's all they had. To give, but they gave. Remember, it's not the amount, it's the motivation of the heart. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. Proverbs are words of wisdom. They're truths, okay? Proverbs 11, 24, 25. There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due and yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous. And he who waters will himself be watered. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word that gives us wisdom and knowledge and instruction. God, sometimes we don't like it. Um, but that really doesn't matter. It's the truth. It's your word. And Lord, we need to learn to be obedient and to be faithful to your word and to the teaching of it. So God, I pray today. Lord, I don't want this to be a, 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 a burden placed upon people. I don't want it to be manipulative. God, I just want us to know the truth about what your word says. And then, Lord, you give us the option to decide whether we're going to be obedient or not. So bless your people today as they give. In Jesus' name, amen. Kirk, if you and whoever's helping you, go ahead and receive the offering. And I'm going to move right on into the second half of our time this morning. And I want to draw your attention to something that I think we often miss uh, regarding the Lord's Prayer. So we've been using Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13 as our text. So let me read that to you as we are getting started this morning. Matthew 6, and this is King James Version, by the way, because this is the way I learned it, uh, memorized it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from our... Now I'm... Now I'm Getting up here in front of me, I want to make sure I said it right. Uh, to give us our, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, some translations, forgive us our trespasses. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I want to take you away from Matthew for a moment and take you over to Luke chapter 11. And I'm going to share it from this passage in the New Living Translation. And I want you to see something. 
Remember, Jesus has just taught his disciples to pray this prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, that, that prayer, right? And look at, what, look at what Luke says in Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Then, teaching them more about prayer. Hello? Teaching them more about prayer, New Living Translation. Now, some of, them, some of the translations just says teaching them more. He continued teaching. If he continued teaching, what was he teaching about? As we we're going to find out, he's teaching them more about prayer. He used this story. So what Jesus taught in what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer was not an all-inclusive teaching. It was, uh, nor was it an all-inclusive prayer. It was the beginning. It was the foundation. It was a guide to get them started. And I love the lesson that follows the teaching of the Lord's Prayer. Listen as I read it to you from Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, New Living Translation. <coughs> Excuse me. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing to feed him. So a friend arrives in the middle of the night, you need to feed him. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed, I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for, for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Whew. Verse 9, so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Your father, your father, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's the deal. Prayer is not about some special formula or some rote phrases that we recite, that we regurgitate over and over again. Prayer is about two things. It's about consistency and persistency. Consistency and persistency. So let's talk about consistency. Consistency. This is what is found in the words Jesus prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? This is, the, this is the part that we usually just focus on. It means we acknowledge who he is, who it is that we are praying to. We acknowledge who it is that we have placed our hope and our trust in. We honor his name. We honor who he is first and foremost. And if nothing else happens in our prayer lives, this must happen. We must honor him. We must glorify him. We must acknowledge who he is. Then we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the consistency part. Okay, stay with me. <clears throat> the Lord, we say, Lord, we want you and your will to be done above all else. Yes, we have our wants. We have our needs. We have our desires. But Father, if those things are not what you want for us, then we want only what you want for us. After all, Father knows best. Father, let your kingdom come. I love that song. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. And here's the part. Right here in my heart. My, my, my. That's what we're praying when we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then we pray in consistency. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. Here's where we get to tell the Father what our needs are. Listen, you're not telling him anything that he doesn't already know. 
There were times when I was raising my kids, when I knew what was going on in their life, I knew what they needed, I knew how I needed to protect or to keep or provide or supply or whatever, but I was just waiting for them to come and bring it to my attention. I already knew, but I wanted to see if they would come to me. Hello? Well, preacher, then why do I even need to pray if God already knows? <laughs> because prayer reminds us that we ain't all that. I am nothing without him. Prayer reminds us who our source is. Prayer reminds us to stay humble and trust God for everything that we have need of. For after all, doesn't it all belong to him and doesn't it all come from him to begin with? And then we pray, forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our debts. Lord, you know I'm a sinner. Saved by grace for which I am eternally and forever grateful. Amen? Lord, you know I'm still, that I still mess things up in my life. Lord, forgive me of all the stupid things that I do. And the list is long. <laughs> I'm sorry. Help me. This is an important part of this portion of the, of the consistency in our prayer. Help me to learn from my mistakes. If you learn from your mistakes, you're less likely to make those mistakes again. The consistency goes on. And forgive us our trespasses. And it says, as we forgive those who trespass against us, as we forgive our debtors. Do you remember what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15? It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But... Some of you need to hear the but today. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard somebody say they hurt me so bad, I will never forgive them. You know what you're doing when you do that? You are condemning yourself. I'm not saying your situation isn't challenging. I'm not saying it isn't difficult. I'm not saying it isn't hurtful. I'm not saying that what was done with you, done to you should not have ever been done. But what I am saying is you better come to grips with it between you and God and figure out how to forgive that person because if you don't, he can't forgive you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God knows that we are easily tempted, but he has promised that with every temptation, he will make a way of escape for us. When I am weak, he is strong. He knows my areas of weakness, and he, uh, he knows your areas of weakness, so I give him access to those areas and say, God, if you don't help me, if you don't uh, provide a way of escape, then I'm doomed. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We wrap up the consistency of our prayer by declaring again his kingdom come, that, that that kingdom will come in power and in might and in glory and that it will last forever and forever and forever. Amen. Consistency in our prayers. But then Jesus takes it from that step and he brings it over into this persistency. This is the new part, the continuation of Jesus' teaching his disciples uh, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray, that we've, we sometimes have forgot. I, I've never connected the two, even though they're right there connected together. Jesus uses a parable to make sure that they get the picture. <laughs> I'm thankful that he doesn't say, here's the information, figure it out. <laughs> I heard a teacher tell my son this one time. I give him the information. If he doesn't get it, that's not my problem. That was the last time my son sat in that lady's classroom. God doesn't do us like that. Here's the parable that he paints, the picture that he tells, the story that he tells. A friend comes over in the middle of the night, banging on your door. You've already gone to bed. The kids are already asleep. And so you roll over, pull the pillow over your head, and pretend like you didn't hear him. But that neighbor keeps on pounding on your door. So what happens? Eventually, you're going to get up and answer the door. And so as the story goes... They have family or friends that have arrived late and your family uh, and your friend has nothing to feed them. Your neighbor has nothing to feed them. So they're asking you to help them out with some of that leftover fried chicken that's in your refrigerator. 
but you want to keep that leftover fried chicken for your lunch tomorrow. And so you turn them away. I don't have anything to give you. But your neighbor doesn't give up because the neighbor heard that, or your neighbor smelled that fried chicken when you were cooking it earlier today. We all know that smell. Hello? And there's nothing like cold fried chicken. Hello? And so the neighbor keeps knocking and keeps knocking. So they start pounding on the door more and more once again. Bro, help me out. You know you got some food in there. I know you got food in there. Help me out. So what happens because of their persistency, because they don't give up, you get up and you give them the fried chicken so they will go away and leave you alone. So you can go back to sleep. Now, time out. When you are persistent with God, he doesn't give you what you want just so you'll go away and leave him alone. That happens in our humanness, hello? But he's God. He wants us to come to him with our every need. He desires. Listen, I love it when my kids say, Dad, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Now they're all grown up. Once in a while, we'll get a call. You know, can you, we're short this week or this month or the car broke down or this broke down or we had to take the kid to the doctor. Could you, could you help us with 100 bucks? And most of the time, if I've got it, I'm more than happy to. But if every week they come to me, Daddy, can I borrow $100? I'm short this week. Daddy, can I borrow $50? I, I don't have gas money this week. Daddy, can you, can you help me with this? I, we're short this week. There comes a point when I'm going to say, no. It's good teaching right here. This is just down, down home practical stuff. I'm telling you straight up, we, we do it. No, I can't help you this time. Because there comes a point where it goes away from helping and becomes uh, enabling. And, and they're making bad choices and they're making bad decisions and they're not preparing for the future. They're not setting aside. They're not thinking ahead. We talked about this with the guys last night. We have an obligation as the men of our home to provide for our family. And that means that we... We, we make a way, we, we work, we provide an income, but we also have wisdom and we set a portion aside so that in those, those rainy days when the car breaks down or the refrigerator goes out, we've got some money. And I'm not perfect, Dad. Ask my wife. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have a dime in savings because I like to spend. We had nothing when I was a kid, nothing. You know where I bought my clothes? Alco and Kmart. Blue light specials, baby. And I was happy to have it. We had nothing. When I finally started working and mowing yards around the neighborhood, I was 9 or 10 years old. I said, I want some new clothes. Daddy said, you got money. You want new clothes? You want Nike tennis shoes? You go buy your own. I had nothing. So when I got a job, when I got in the Navy, and they're giving me several hundred dollars a month, and I don't have rent, I don't have utilities, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have to pay for, I'm eating whether I got any money or not. Let me tell you what, when we got married, she had all the savings and I had all the debt because I spent everything I had and then some. There comes a point where we have to say no. And there may come a point when God will say, not this time. That's called love. Okay, let me, I'm almost done. <laughs> if I can figure out where I am. Jesus is saying, when you pray, be persistent. Don't give up. The text goes on and talks about this. Keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. In the original language, the idea is to ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. In other words, don't give up. Not talking about nagging God. Hello? Nobody likes a nag, right? But in faith. Not talking about demanding from God, but I'm de talking about declaring in faith. God, you are my source. God, you are my provider. God, you, you can make a way where there seems to be no way. I don't have to understand it, God. My hope and my trust is in you. Do what only you can do. Why do we keep uh, asking and knocking and seeking? Because if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more so does God know how to give good things to his kids? To those who ask, to those who knock, 
those who seek and those who keep on keeping on. In the old days, the saints would ask each other, and I think this is probably more traditional in, in a black church type of setting. Uh, I, I, I can hear um, Carlton Pearson, Bishop Carlton Pearson, Pentecostal Church of God in Christ, and I can hear him telling a story about a little old church mom, and they would say this, you yet holding on? And they reply, yeah, I'm still holding on. Well, you keep on keeping on. That's the asking and the knocking and the seeking, the being the consistent prayer and being the persistent prayer. Church, we can't uh, come to the Father with some mamby-pamby prayers and think we're gonna, he's going to wave some magic wand and all of our troubles are going to go away and all our needs are going to be met. Hello? Good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. Doesn't cut it, right? I want to be careful here because I'm not saying if we pray so hard and we pray so long that God doesn't have a choice but to answer. That's, that isn't how it works. This is about uh, grabbing hold of the hem of his garment and not letting go. This is about spiritual warfare, doing battle in our war rooms. It's about understanding that if God is able... Nothing and no one is able to stop him. So when we pray, we pray with reverence and honor being shown to the God of the universe. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. We ask uh, God to help us to forgive those who have wronged us. And then we intercede like our life depends on it because maybe it does. And you keep bringing that prayer back to God day and night and night and day until God gives you the victory. The victory is the answer. And, 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 if, and if you don't, and, and, and until you get the answer, uh, he may just give you peace over the situation. It talked about in the old church days, talked about praying through. Talked about tarrying in the altar, waiting upon the Lord. <laughs> because God is able. Listen. God is not in the microwave business. He is not in the fast food business. God is not some divine Santa Claus in the sky. He doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. Hello? But he does love us <laughs> with a love that, I, quite honestly, I don't think we even really begin to comprehend. So we hold on to him. We hold tight to his hand in faith, believing that he is able. He is able. So I'm going to close with this right here. Let's just get straight to it. You've got something in your heart right now that's weighing you down, that's holding you back, that's consuming you from the inside out, and, and it's not God that's consuming you. It's this thing. It's this issue. Uh, maybe it's a need. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a physical ailment maybe it's a you fill in the blank but whatever it is that is weighting you down and holding you back I'm going to challenge you I told you let's just get right at it I'm going to challenge you to get out of your seat and come and find a place to pray Eli put uh, same God and, and amazing grace if we need it after that uh, but come and find a place to pray at this altar and call out to the one who is able hello you may need to be here for 10 minutes. You may need to be here for a couple hours. The, uh, let me back up. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and come and find a place to pray. And there's got to be somebody. I mean, we've got one. But go ahead and start the music, Eli. I know they'll mute us on Facebook, but I don't care. <laughs> 